Welcome to the making of Cleveland's Black Suburb in the City, Lee Seville and Lee Harvard. Lee Harvard becomes Cleveland's leading middle-class African-American neighborhood. Chapter 3. Cleveland was on the verge of momentous change at the end of World War II, with major implications for its African-American residents and especially those striving to acquire better housing at the urban periphery. In 1950, with suburbanization just picking up, the city reached its peak population of over 900,000 people. That year, nearly 148,000 African Americans lived in Cleveland, over 16% of the total population. By 1960, with the Great Migration still going strong, the black population had jumped again to almost 251,000 or nearly 29%. Our third chapter focuses on the area north of Miles Road known as Lee Harvard. Housing construction in Lee Harvard stalled during the Great Depression but resumed after World War II as larger builders began to meet the demand for suburban housing and families spent their wartime savings on new homes. Two-thirds of the neighborhood's houses were built after 1950 as developers erected single-family ranches and colonials, thereby quite literally providing a suburban atmosphere within the city limits. Like many whites who moved to the suburbs, middle-class African-American families had saved their wartime earnings and were continuing to make good wages. They had money and knew where they wanted to spend it. The challenge was to find a path to the suburban periphery, risking white hostility and navigating the unfair financial practices of the time, which for African-Americans made purchasing a home more expensive and, if located outside of an area of established black residency, far more difficult. In 1953, Wendell and Genevieve Stewart moved on to Talford Avenue in Lee Harvard, becoming the first African-American residents of the previously all-white neighborhood. Mr. Stewart was a funeral director and Mrs. Stewart worked as a retail store supervisor. The couple had previously owned a home in Glenville. Upon discovering the purchase, white Lee Harvard residents were outraged, the Stewart's middle-class background notwithstanding. Tensions and threats escalated in the weeks leading up to the move. Mayor Charles Burke provided police protection. Once the Stewarts had made clear they intended to stay, Mayor Burke pronounced he would continue the police protection for as long as necessary, and he even agreed to address a meeting of 500 angry white residents where he defended the Stewarts' right to the property. On their move-in day, the couple hired a crew headed up by local heavyweight boxing champion Jimmy Bivens just in case any trouble should develop. As tensions gradually wound down, Mr. Stewart asked after a few months that police protection be discontinued. Although this was restored after the following spring when vandals defaced the house's new paint job and broke the front window in November. Judging by the Stewart's experience, the possibility of retaliation simply for wanting to live in the best neighborhood one could afford lay just below the surface. James Richards moved to Lee Harvard with his family in 1959. They were the first African-American family on their street, and the welcome wasn't what they had wished. Mr. Richards recalls, the house was empty. We were trying to get the keys. My dad made the first mortgage payment in July, kept calling, and it was Isaac Higgins Realty. He was one of the few black realtors back then that helped blacks move out here, and Cleveland Trust Bank, which the headquarters was, or the branch that we went to, was at the corner of Lakeview and Superior. That was the only bank that would finance Blacks back then for homes out in this area. My dad had made the first two months mortgage payments on it, and we would ride out here constantly from Glenville. 
It seemed like a long way at that time. We would ride out here and just walk around the house. My mother was bringing plants from our old house. The realtor was trying to get the key from the previous owners. They were just so nasty, they wouldn't give us the key. It was getting close to September and school was going to start. Came to September, we was trying to register for school. So you had to have your lights turned on. All you needed was a piece of paper to show that you had uh, deed to that property. Uh, so we couldn't get in. So my mother, put me through the mail chute. I always say I was the first break-in in the mail chute. <laughs> <laughs> put me through the mail chute. Through the milk chute, because the milk chute is the most of the the milk chute is all on there. And I would put me through the milk chute. My daddy went up to, this the first uh, hardware right there was uh, at Biltmore. It was a hardware at Biltmore. So that first night we were in there, uh, the bad part came, the shot door our window. And shot through our window. And by it being shaker, I remember the shaker police coming. And then the next night, it burned a cross on our body. But it, was, it wasn't a big cross. It was like two sticks. We found out who did it later on. <laughs> but it was just like just two sticks together. It wasn't no big down south type cross. It was like it, it, uh, it wasn't even about, about that big. They just stuck it in the front line and did it. Uh, but found out years later, it was uh, some guys down the street, uh, some uh, white guys that I grew up with. We eventually became friends after we had our first fight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that's my story on, on the community. Also, my dad belonged to the old civil with Mr. Tanton. In a turbulent era with black civil rights and fair access to good housing as an increasingly urgent nationwide issue, Upwardly mobile African-American families continued their pursuit of the American dream. More moved into the northeastern quadrant of the Lee Harvard neighborhood by 1957, five of them on to Talford Avenue. Although problems of obtaining credit remained, black buyers found creative workarounds like purchasing through a supportive white intermediary arranging mortgages with individual owners instead of banks, or borrowing through the Quincy Savings and Loan, which since 1952 had been under African-American ownership. Zeddy and Shirley Coley purchased their home in Lee Harvard in 1964 from an Italian family. The image on the left shows their realtor presenting the family with a door key. Mr. Coley recalls, my wife decided she was tired of renting. Our realtor, Grace, brought us to this neighborhood. The neighborhood had a lot of professional people, teachers, doctors, attorneys, and people who worked in industries in Cleveland. And now we can hear from Mr. Taverner Collier tell how he came to live in Lee Harvard. There wasn't any houses built at that time. It was just but he was just starting to do the, the road work. And so I had an opportunity to look and see what was going on. And then I found out who the builders were. At that time, I can't even think of the name of the builders right now, but they had an office, 147th in, uh, in Harvard. And so that's where I found out who, who the developers were. And so I met with them and sat down and talked with them about what they had. Prices was always important. And the kind of a house, because there was no house for me to look at. So they had several designs and basically all of them, they all were about the same. Only then you had an opportunity to do if you wanted to add something on or pick something off and do something else within that within the structure. So I knew a little bit but I didn't know a whole lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, so but uh, I, I thought this was something that I wanted. Now, just, just looking at it from that at the beginning, I said, oh, my goodness, it's all muddy. Those streets, you know, <laughs> nothing was out there, you know. <laughs> but uh, I said, well, you got to start someplace. Right. So we decided to pursue uh, of trying to buy, and, and then we did buy 
and it bless you know I was I'm the I'm a veteran Korean War, mm -hmm. and so I used my uh, my GI Bill to uh, to get you know a good rate a long rate on that, mm -hmm. and so that was that was sometime around about I'm gonna say March or April of '52, and I was able to move in in November of not 52, I mean 62. I moved in in 62, that's one of that year. When Cleveland Press reporter Julian Krawcheck interviewed both white and new black Lee Harvard residents for a 1961 feature on blockbusting, he found a wide variety of sentiments, from anger to resignation, hopefulness, and in some cases, acceptance, while some whites expressed resentment and felt they had little choice but to leave, others found their new neighbors took excellent care of their houses, renovating them and finishing basements, and were quite often friendly. For their part, Black Lee Harvard residents tended toward indifference in the face of white departure. They pointed out that no one was forcing the former occupants out, and they themselves had not sought to move there because they desired to live in a racially integrated neighborhood per se. Rather, they had sought the best quality of life they could afford, paying a premium to access the area's new housing, shopping facilities, and schools in hope of giving their children the best possible chance of success. Racial integration also played out in some of the neighborhood's churches. For example, the Lee Road Baptist Church reportedly began as an all-white congregation in 1944. The first African-American member was said to have joined the very next year, and the church subsequently followed the overall neighborhood trend to become majority black over the following decade. Although the original pastor, who was said to be white, the Reverend Donald L. Wright, continued to serve until his death in 1977. Hosting the Lee Harvard Community Association since 1953, Lee Road Baptist Church has had an important role in the civic life of the neighborhood. Ms. Mary Smith and her daughter, Carolyn, recall moving into the neighborhood near Lee Road Baptist Church. We moved uh, to Stockbridge, 1961. Uh, we attended Lee Road Baptist Church previously. We had no idea we would end up moving into the neighborhood. We liked the church at the corner of Lee Road and Stockbridge. So when the house became available, we knew exactly where it was because we attended the church. Uh, it was a very beautiful neighborhood. We were captivated by it. It was quiet, um, very little talking, very little. Neighbors were very quiet. Most of them were raising young families. At the time, uh, we didn't have any children. So we just, I just thought the kids were just nice. We came, went, we just saw them moving around in the neighborhood. But it was a beautiful neighborhood. The St. Henry Parish was formed in October 1946 to serve the fast-growing Lee Seville and Lee Harvard neighborhoods. The parish operated despite racial changes in the neighborhood and a decreasing number of Catholics. Following the closure of the convent in 1968, the parish leased the building to the city of Cleveland, which started the Harvard Community Services Center in the space. Later, the parish sold the building to the Harvard Community Services Corporation. In the fall of 1993, St. Henry School merged with St. Timothy and was renamed Archbishop-like school after Archbishop James Patterson Like, the first African-American bishop in Cleveland. The Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd was formed in 1946 and held services at Gracemont School 
In May of 1949, the congregation broke ground on a simple frame church with a steeple. As the congregation grew, plans were drawn for a larger building. The congregation broke ground in February 1959 with a sanctuary for 350 people, overflow space for 100, an office, pastor study, mother's room, and sacristy. It was a modern facility. Advent Evangelical Lutheran Church was part of the Lutheran Church in America denomination, was begun by Reverend Alan G. Youngblood in December 1960. By the time the Advent Lutheran Congregation purchased the building in early 1962, it was run down. They put a small steeple on the storefront and occupied it until beginning construction on their new building in the spring of 1965. The architecturally distinguished mid-century building was designed by Whitley Whitley Architects, an African-American firm with roots in the neighborhood. Lee Harvard's demographics shifted quickly as it, along with the adjoining Lee Seville, became the city's black middle-class preserve and a center for civic pride and achievement. Already by 1965, African-Americans made up 75% of Lee Harvard's population. The local Urban League determined that Southeast Cleveland was the highest income area of African-Americans in the entire state of Ohio, with the 1970 census indicating that Lee Harvard's median income was more than double the city average. This sense of civic pride was upheld by block clubs and neighborhood associations. Dr. Suzanne Hawthorne Clay remembers how block clubs and residents worked to make the neighborhood attractive and well-kept. It was just a, um, it was a wonderful way to grow up. Um, they were very meticulous about the way that your home looked outside, that everyone's grass was cut. Um, like I said, I lived next door to Mr. Jones, who was, he was um, the head custodian at Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, and his house and the yard was immaculate mm -hmm. all the time. And, and across the street from um, Mr. Marcus, William Marcus, who was the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he was in the garden clubs and was probably a master gardener. The way that his uh, the way that his yard looked, so they were the standard, and so the rest of us would try to be as close to um, in, in cl as close to uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Marcus's standard as we could be, and they would even give us give the families our parents like tips on what to do and when you should replace your lawn and how do you get rid of crabgrass and stuff like that. Um, on 153rd, you did not have junk cars in the yard. You did not have leave your trash cans out after the trash had been picked up. Once, you know, back then the trash men would pick up the trash cans mm -hmm. and take them back and then and gradually you had to bring your own trash cans out mm -hmm. and take them back, but you didn't leave them out. What would happen there. if you did? Well, how is the how is this all maintained? Um, you may get a citation or a call from you know, the street club. From the street club. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mm -hmm. The street club may, may complain or ask you if you need some help. Um, it was nothing for folks like um, my father or like Mr. Stevenson um, to, um, to go out and help somebody. You know, someone wasn't able to cut their grass or, you know, or send the sons out. To, you know, so that they were just very careful about the way that the um, way that the street looked. The Harvard Community Services Center was founded in 1968 by Mrs. Ruby Jones McCullough to serve the Lee, Harvard, and Lee Seville neighborhoods. The Harvard Community Services Center has operated as a community development corporation, providing early childhood education, community recreation, a food pantry, and senior services. Here, Jean Pinckney recalls the Buttons and Bows Club and Carolyn Smith remembers the Harvard Hens. 
We had a club for our kids when we first moved here, and we called it Buttons and Bows. And we would meet with them, well, the parents would meet once a, once a month, and then the next month we would take the kids someplace. We rented a bus and went to the Blue Hole in Toledo, which was a waste, <laughs> but it was fun. And we would take them to all the different museums. We took them to the Meadow Museum, um, just just to give the kids something to do so that they got to know each other and they were, you know, always friends. One of the things that I really enjoyed, my mother um, enrolled me in the um, Harvard Hens, which was um, a mother and daughter group that was um, out of the Harvard Community Services Center. Mm. And um, the lady who now runs the Fatima Center um, mm -hmm. down on Lexington and Foot Hub, she was the director of the program. What's her name? Ray. Oh, um, yes, Mrs. Ray. Um, mm -hmm. Mrs. Ray, she's now another name, mm -hmm. but I think it was LaJean Ray. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so she, um, we used to have so much fun. I mean, it just, everybody in the neighborhood was in the program and they just kept us busy. And everything we did was fun. The mm -hmm. hay rides, mm -hmm. the, you know, we did educational things, but um, I really enjoyed that. And then when I was a, a, a younger child, the nursery school that I went to was in the church at Lee Road. And um, we had a lot of fun um, just being in the neighborhood because everybody in the neighborhood went to Lee Road Baptist Church and or they went to the Harbor Community Services Center, but everything in the neighborhood was self-sufficient. So um, the only thing that we left the neighborhood to do was go roller skating and ice skating mm -hmm. into the movies. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody else, everything that we did was in the neighborhood. So that was really a lot of fun. Besides economic stability, a strong tradition of civic participation developed. Residents were known for being politically active and engaged with the area, having one of the highest voter turnouts in the city. Black residents had been active in the founding of the Lee Harvard Community Association in 1957, which was effectively run out of the Lee Road Baptist Church. It counted 2,300 members by 1969. It sponsored a summer arts festival starting in 1968, an annual back to school parade, and events like political candidate forums. Some 40 street clubs were active in the area as of 1970, and for a time, the neighborhood printed its own newspaper, the Lee Harvard Community Star. Mr. Taverner Collier shares his memories of the street clubs. Almost every street at that time, it was like from, from Harvard going north, and a few homes south of Harvard coming this way. They were made up of street clubs where they had meetings. Most of the time at that time, street clubs were meeting in individual homes. They let you have a meeting and you come in and you have maybe coffee or some punch or something like that. But that's where they had their meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, on every street, Everybody may not have came to those meetings, but they had the name and address of every homeowner or every person who lived there. So in case something went wrong, they knew how to get in contact with that person. That's how, that's how close it was at that time. In 1971, Billy J. Tanton organized the Harvard Service Patrol, an auxiliary police unit that also conducted fundraisers and events for children. Meeting in a headquarters donated by a car dealership, it additionally served the function of a social club for the men who participated. Mr. Tavernier Collier remembers his time with the auxiliary police. We had a fellow there who was uh, by the name of Arthur Green. He knew a Mr. A.D. Pilonis who owned the Oldsmobile dealership there on, on Lee Road there in, in Shaker. And he had a vacant building 
at Lee and Glendale was formerly a used car lot when it was vacant. And so he went to him and asked him, could we use that building? And so he agreed to let, to let us use that building, but we had to go in and remodel, remodel it. We used our own money, our own resources, and whatever skills that each of us had, we used that to fix that building up and make it a, a nice facility right there. And eventually we had, we were able to get a couple of cars by a gentleman who was with us. He, he worked with a, with the cab company. I think it was the general cab company. And he had a good job down there. So he was able to get a couple of cars for us. And then we were able to get those cars painted by Earl Shag uh, at a paint shop right there at Lee and Miles. Then from that, we were able to buy some radios to install in the cars. We were able to buy CDs and a CB station so that we could communicate when we were out patrolling. If we saw anything out there that needed to be reported, we would get back to the base station and then the person who was working at the base station if there was a need to, they would call a uh, notified the police officers that there was something going on that was unusual. Mr. Billy Tanton recalls the police auxiliary also sponsored bicycle rodeos and other activities for children to build good relations with the police department. As time went along, the ladies became a part of the auxiliary. We had ladies patrolling but most of the time, the ladies stayed at the center and monitored the radio while we were out patrolling. Images from a Halloween party hosted by the police auxiliary. Perhaps most ambitiously in 1972, a group of African-American investors organized as Southeast Renaissance Inc. purchased the Lee Road Shopping Center built in 1949 raising some of the funding by selling stock certificates to community residents. Celebrated at its opening as the largest black owned commercial complex in the nation, it persevered through a difficult economy until its owners finally had to put the property up for sale in 1978. Lee Harvard has been a suburb in the city complete with suburban style drive-ins long before they appeared in Cleveland's older neighborhoods. In 1963, the Burger Chef was at 174 15 Harvard Avenue. Certainly a lot has changed since the early 20th century when African Americans looked to the urban periphery as a way to escape the crowded and disadvantageous conditions coming to characterize inner city neighborhoods but true to its history of striving amid challenges and its proud self-sufficiency, Lee Harvard and Lee Seville continues as a stable, civic-minded and verdant suburb in the city. Our community has so many advantages. We are well located by major transportation routes such as Harvard, Lee, I-480 and Warrensville Center. All the essential services are accessible, such as a library, banks, supermarkets, and post office. We have a recreation center and track, Karuish Park, and a number of small community parks. We have daycares, senior and social services. Two major hospitals are nearby, UH Ahuja Medical Center and South Point Cleveland Clinic Campus. Our housing stock is mostly single family and moderately priced, and new developments are planned. Most persons know their neighbors, and a variety of community groups encourage resident participation. When problems come, we band together to work them out. This is a resilient community. Pearl Thompson. This concludes Chapter 3. Lee Harvard becomes Cleveland's leading middle-class African-American neighborhood.